Marga Leoti, I start by asking you directly, is there a faction in the Russian establishment, in politics, army, maybe in secret service that would agree to remove Vladimir Putin from power? Oof. <laughs> I mean, I mean, at this stage, I'm sure there's a lot of people within the system who are wishing that someone else would remove mm -hmm. Vladimir Putin from power, whether that's mortality or, or state action. I think the problem is that you know, this is a system which has a very strongly established internal defense mechanisms against any such actions. And therefore, it really would have to be a dramatic situation to actually push people to take to take that risk mm -hmm. we are not uh, right now in this dramatic situation not yet i mean i think that you know we'll have to see i mean the interesting thing is this kind of level of economic warfare mm -hmm. that is being waged by the west against russia it's unparalleled mm -hmm. we have absolutely no idea of how much the impact would be we'll, we've never seen such an attack against such a large economy, but also an economy that is so interconnected with the world, mm -hmm. global supply chains, um, everything from, you know, that th they want to be able to use their iPhones mm -hmm. to that they sell their grain and their oil and their gas and such like. Mm -hmm. So you have economists who say that the Russian economy will, will cope with it. Mm -hmm. You have economists that say it will collapse within weeks. Yeah, you know, this yeah. is one for the textbooks. Um, so there, there's the economic dimension, which is kind of no one's quite certain what the real impact is going to be. The military situation, it's clearly going badly in Ukraine, but we shouldn't read too much into what the first few weeks tell us. You know, wars take time. We, you know, we, we have a tendency now to expect everything to happen quickly. Um, the Russians, yes, they've taken some substantial losses. They, they're really running up to the le levels of their logistical capabilities, but they can still salvage something from the war in, in Ukraine. Mm -hmm. And, you know, therefore, from the point of view of the people, you know, essentially ruthless, pragmatic opportunists in the system, mm -hmm. it's not yet that point to necessarily take serious risks that will be taken to go after Putin. You know, uh, I'm thinking about uh, Ukrainians. They said that uh, they uh, managed to stop a few uh, murder attempts of Zelensky because mm -hmm. they had information from inside the uh, Russian intelligence. Could this, this be true or is it just a strategy? I honestly don't know. I think this is the interesting thing. We are also in a very, very active information war. Yeah. And not only are the Ukrainians proving pretty good at this, yeah. so too the West is involved. And there's the, the overt side of that, which is, you know, shots of Zelensky out on the streets of mm. Kiev and such like very um, you know, dramatic contrast with mm. sort of Putin in his bunker at the end of his long table. Mm. And then there's also the, the shadowy covert information war. And it's the same way as we've had these supposed letters from an FSB analyst mm. doing the rounds saying oh, how terrible it all is and so forth. It's just very difficult to know whether or not the individual things actually are honest or whether they're part of a mm. campaign precisely to create suspicion and recrimination and paranoia within Moscow. Mm -hmm. But what I would say is what makes them effective as information weapons is they do speak to some real tensions in Russia, it is clear that there's a lot of people who are un unhappy with what way things are going. And there are some people who might even be willing to do something about it as long as it's safe for them. Whether that also includes leaking information about assassination attempts on Zelensky, wow. I mean, I think that's the kind of thing that gets you to be blunt, um, you know, on a treason charge if you're caught. Mm -hmm. So I'm not quite certain. Mm -hmm. And there is a, another part of this uh, Ukrainian narrative, let's say it, the Russian army, the great Russian army was often ridiculed these days. They failed to seize ma major cities uh, in almost three weeks of war. The Russian soldiers are reportedly in a bad shape uh, and there are many victims am among them. Is Putin's army really in a bad, underperforming state? Or is, it, is, this, is this a part of this Ukrainian narrative of this informational war? Again, I think the honest answer is, is it, it, it's both. I mean, mm. the, the reason why information narratives are effective is mm. when they are rooted in truth. Mm. 
And I think, you know, if one looks at the Russian military, yes, I mean, there are, you know, a whole variety of, of long term systemic problems which have emerged. But mainly, I can't help but feel, and this is something I sort of put in an article, that actually the Ukrainian secret weapon was Vladimir Putin. I mean, he clearly only made the decision to invade very much at the last minute. I mean, we've, we've had this really long build up, but we've now had um, leaks coming out of American intelligence that confirmed that he sort of only made the decision at the very end, which meant that actually the serious preparations were not being made. And that's logistical, but also psychological. Most of the soldiers didn't think they were going into war. Most of the generals didn't think they were going into war. But also you had this very initial strange approach that the Russians used of sending these very small, lightly armed paratrooper forces into mm -hmm. Kyiv and so forth. That only makes sense if you have this kind of bizarre notion that indeed the Ukrainian state is not a real country. And at the very first push, the whole Ukrainian regime will collapse, mm -hmm. which is clearly what Putin was thinking. And I think this is it. I think Putin's own political prejudices and assumptions about Ukraine forced the Russian military to fight in a way that it's not used to fighting. Usually it's precisely, it, it's methodical and comprehensive, and it starts with massive barrages and so forth. None of these things were, were done. So in some ways, I think they started in a very poor position because of Putin's own um, you know, decision to do it at the last minute and to the way he wanted to do it. And so now they're having to try and recover. But it, mm. when you start a war on the wrong foot, it's really quite, quite difficult to do so. Mm. They're doing their best, but there's still all kinds of signs. And in fact, you know, it, 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 it'll be hard for them to recover from those first two weeks mm. of blunder. Uh, let's talk about Putin like, like, like your book, let's say. <laughs> what advantage does Vladimir Putin still have? And how serious is uh, uh, this uh, nuclear threat? Well, to start with the nuclear threat, because I think it's a good way of illustrating this. Look, I mean, I don't actually think it's serious at this point. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is essentially signaling. This is about Putin wanting to say, look, you may have a kind of a financial nuclear option, but remember I have the real thing. Because the, the orders he gave about bringing the, the nuclear forces up to a heightened state of ready, I mean, they, they, they were meaningless. They actually had no particular impact in, in what happens with the Russian mm -hmm. nuclear forces. But it also speaks to one of Putin's kind of classic strengths is that he, he doesn't follow the rules, whether it's the international law or just the norms, the etiquette, shall we say, of international behavior. And that gave him a kind of a, an illusory strength for a long time. Mm -hmm. However, now he's in a proper war. You can't bluff bully and bluster your way past anti-tank gun and, and, and missiles of the installations and such like. And I think this is where his, his strategy falls short. You know, he always relied on Western um, hesitation, mm -hmm. disunity and restraint that we always thought, oh, we don't want to get in too much involved. I mean, like now, you know, we're, we're saying rightly, NATO forces are not going to start going into Ukraine to go nose to nose. But the point is the Ukrainians, they're not, obviously in, in this situation, they're an existential struggle for their survival. Mm -hmm. um, they are not gonna be bullied. They are not gonna be restrained. They're gonna fight with every means at their disposal. And this is something that in, in a way negates a lot of Putin's advantage that he's had. Mm -hmm. And also, I think the thing is that what was, what was shocking and surprising in 2014, is no longer quite so shocking and surprising in 2022. We've had eight years in some ways of wartime Putin. Mm -hmm. And so we've now got a much better sense of, 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 of what he is capable and isn't capable of doing. So again, I think in many ways, it's, it's that his, his act is an increasingly old one. Okay, he, uh, Putin we know has become a pariah in the West, uh, uh, Russia as well, but who are his allies now? Today, we know that uh, Putin asked for help, asked China mm -hmm. for military help. Yeah, and he's not getting it. No, I mean, you know, who, who are Putin's allies now? Wow. Venezuela and Syria. I mean, what's it, what really can one say? Because even where one can see, I mean, like with, with um, Iran, mm -hmm. 
there are certain common interests in Syria. But on the other hand, Russia and Iran are also regional rivals. Likewise, sometimes Russia has been able to find common cause with Turkey. But Turkey is still a NATO member and again, very much a regional rival, as we saw with the Armenia-Azerbaijan war. Likewise, China. China is happy to see Russia as a disruptive force. When it was a way of just simply getting the West's attention, the Chinese were happy to talk up the Moscow-Beijing alliance. But there's never been any particularly warm relationship, but despite, you know, beneath all the talk about unlimited sort of friendship. Of course. What, the, what the Chinese want from the Russians, they buy. You know, energy, et cetera. They just buy it. But, I mean, remember, Beijing didn't even recognize the annexation of Crimea. Mm-hmm. So, and it's very clear that it's, I mean, it's not going to jeopardize the vastly more valuable trade with Europe and the United States, uh, just for the sake of Russia. Will Putin be satisfied if he manages to keep Ukraine uh, indefinitely as a theater of war? Because you've mentioned Syria. Like an unmanageable, uh, unmanageable country between Russia and the West. I don't think Putin would be able to keep uh, Ukraine in a constant state of, of conflict. I mean, already it's interesting. We've seen the initial ambitions, the so-called denazification, mm-hmm. and that carried with it the implication that basically all of Ukraine would be under Russian control if through some kind of puppet government. Then a week ago, they issued new sort of peace terms which actually talked about just simply demilitarizing Ukraine, you know, that Ukraine would be neutral and that it would recognize Russia's claim to Crimea and the Donbass. So already, in effect, they, they down, downsized their expectations from the whole country to just the east. Now, look, those terms were still problematic for the Ukrainians, rightly so, because of the neutrality requirements and things, because it would give the Russians a chance to come back some other time. Mm-hmm. But nonetheless, I think they demonstrate the extent to which Putin is becoming aware that he's bitten off far more than he can chew. And I think this is more likely to be the kind of contours of an eventual deal. Mm-hmm. That there is a Ukraine which may or may not accept some agreement to not become part of NATO, but which will absolutely be militarized. Mm-hmm. And then Russia just simply has consolidated in the east in all or part of the Donbass regions. So in some ways, actually, Russia will have gained very, very little and lost one hell of a lot Mm -hmm. as a result of this war. So Ukraine is all that Putin wants. He doesn't want more like uh, Moldavia, like a NATO country, because he seems (laughs) to provocate. Yeah, I mean, I I really see no signs that there's kind of wider goals. I mean, if he'd ever wanted Moldova, he could do much more. I mean, Moldova is a small country. But no, Ukraine matters. Mm -hmm. Ukraine matters to Putin on several levels. One is it's this kind of cultural, historical role that Ukraine plays for Russians. Remember, you know, Kiev is the mother of Russian cities. And, you know, again, if we think of Putin himself, who clearly has at least one eye on his historic legacy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He does not want to be the czar who lost Ukraine to Russia. You know, that, 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 that would be, you know, the, the one thing that he'd probably end up remembered for. So it's about that. But also from his point of view, Ukraine and the whole issue of European security architecture are connected. I mean, his, it's interesting that, you know, in his speeches, he would talk much less about Ukrainian NATO membership than he would about NATO forces Mm -hmm. on Ukrainian soil. Mm -hmm. I mean, his idea, his fear was, and I think it was a genuine fear. I mean, not that I think it would happen, but I think he, you know, this is not just propaganda, is his fear was that Ukraine would become the base for NATO forces and NATO missiles and and everything else. And in in some ways be a sort of advanced platform for what he regards as a hostile anti-Russian alliance, nestling up, Um, against against Russia. So, I mean, I think, you know, from his point of view, these things all come together in a way that, look, I mean, does he like the Poland, for example? I doubt it, given what the Poles think of him. Um, but there's, you know, firstly, there's absolutely none of this emotional historical resonance. Yeah. And secondly, look, the Russians are having trouble dealing with Ukraine. How on earth could they cope with a military alliance, which let's not forget, 
even if you just take out the Americans and the Canadians, mm -hmm. NATO has more troops than Russia. Mm -hmm. and, and most of them are better troops. Um, and then there is also America and Canada. You know, I mean, there's just, there is just no logic to this. I mean, even if, let's say, there's some kind of a deal is struck in Ukraine in the next few weeks, the damage done to the Russian armed forces is going to take years to rebuild. Mm -hmm. So this is not the country that's going to be in a position to threaten NATO. What can the West and NATO still do without going... Uh to war with Russia, because we saw yesterday, there were some declaration that if Russia would use chemical weapons, NATO should change uh, his position. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing. In some ways, there's only a limit to what NATO can do now. I mean, in, because of the scale of sanctions and such like, this, it's hard to think of what meaningful action it could take mm -hmm. that would not begin to cross other lines. We could do things like carry out active cyber attacks mm -hmm. on Russia, but Russia would no doubt regard this as hostile. And again, I don't, it doesn't mean to say that they didn't you know, actively invade, but they would unleash, you know, they themselves would, 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 would escalate too. Mm -hmm. um, I think this is one of the issues. We shouldn't have to feel that we constantly are in some kind of escalation race. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have deployed this massive um, attack economically, which will take time to work, but nonetheless, you know, is actually, I think it's, it's going to be a truly devastating um, impact for Russia. Um, but the point is, yeah, we, 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 we mustn't and we can't really escalate much beyond that. Mm -hmm. And we also have to think about the, the unintended consequences. I mean, look, already, you know, Russians are having trouble finding insulin and other medicines. And my big fear is that if we are too indiscriminate in our economic warfare, mm -hmm. actually what we will do is create a generation of Russians who actually blame us mm -hmm. and are angry with the West and that we in effect win the war, but lose the peace the, the way we did in 1918 with Germany. Mm -hmm. like, after, uh, like after the Soviet, in 1991 well, so, I mean, it was... Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, we 1990s was was a period in which you know, Western policy towards Russia was was very very short sighted. Mm -hmm. um, you know, at the time, I mean, obviously we we, we focused on the Central European countries mm -hmm. of the former Warsaw Pact and the Baltic states. Mm -hmm. Rightly, we wanted to bring them into the embrace mm -hmm. of Europe very quickly, but we pretty much neglected Russia, and we we allowed all kinds of unfortunate understandings. You know, when, when Boris Yeltsin shelled his own parliament, which was admittedly an unpleasant parliament he'd inherited from the Soviets, mm -hmm. but still constitutionally, at that point, he was not president. But still, he shelled it into submission and then he rewrote the constitution to say it was okay. And because we didn't like the parliament, we said, that's fine. 1996, the communists look as if they're gonna win the elections. Mm -hmm. So they're rigged. Now, we didn't like the communists, so we acknowledged the, the rigged elections. Fine, I can understand the immediate mm. short-term reasons for that, but we could hardly then be surprised if the Russians think, well, democracy is clearly a farce, the West is only interested mm. in its own interests, and all for all their talk about values and democracy and human rights and such like, ah, that's just sanctimonious hypocrisy. Mm -hmm. Um, no, I mean, I think this is it. We, you know, we should be thinking now. I mean, obviously, we need to focus now on, on actually saving Ukraine and winning this war that we are in. But we should also be thinking about the peace afterwards. Especially that in Russia now, it's the beginning of a dictatorship. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think this is it. Sort of Putin has managed to squander all the, the advances that have been made. And basically it was almost trying to drag Russia back to the late 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, of course, I mean, this is a very different Russia. This is also the Russia of, you know, Telegram and, um, you know, Kontakte and mm -hmm. McDonald's and iPhones and everything else. And Russians are unlikely to sort of be, be, as, be as willing to accept that. Mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, you know, I think that, 
the Putin regime is not, you know, is not going to improve itself. You know, we're, we're, talk, we're wondering about you know, what can happen after Putin. But after Putin could be sooner than we think. Mm -hmm. Let's say the war ends with a compromise. First, will Putin keep his power in Russia? And two, will he avoid the Haga? Um, a lot depends on what the compromise means for economic sanctions. I mean, clearly, there will have to be, in order to make a deal, some lifting of some of the sanctions. Mm -hmm. But conversely, if he still keeps control of Donbass and Crimea, mm -hmm. some of the sanctions will stay. Mm -hmm. So, you know, first of all, this question of, you know, what will be the, you know, the, the, the lasting economic impact? Mm -hmm. Um, secondly, the big uncertainty is at the moment, most Russians are being fed this toxic propaganda about the fact that it's a limited operation because Ukraine was going to get nukes and all sorts of nonsense. And you might say that there's, there's always inevitably an initial kind of rally around the flag support for the regime in time of crisis. And people are willing to kind of believe the news because they have nothing to compare it with. Mm -hmm. But if I think back, look, I mean, I did my doctorate on the Soviet war in Afghanistan. And one of the things I looked at was precisely how the propaganda broke down. Mm -hmm. And the answer is it broke down as soon as it might say affected people's lives. And as soon as, you know, that boy down the street came back mm -hmm. from the war with his tales of horror, or maybe mm -hmm. with only one arm, or maybe he didn't come back at all. Mm -hmm. That's when you suddenly think, hang on a minute, this is different. Well, we're gonna see that happen at a much faster rate. Mm -hmm. First of all, because there's a lot more troops, you know, sort of coming back. Mm -hmm. I mean, when, there are more troops in Ukraine today than the peak of Soviet forces in Afghanistan, and the Soviet Union was a country three times mm -hmm. bigger, two times bigger. Um, but secondly, obviously, social media and everything else will mean that the word gets mm -hmm. out that much more quickly. Um, and I think that's that's going to be the, the uncertainty. I mean, I, I honestly can't predict whether or not the state will manage to control those voices. Mm -hmm and the impact or whether it will just become you know, too, too great. Mm -hmm. But when it comes down to it, I think unless things go disastrously badly, I honestly think that um, we're, you know, we and the Russians are stuck with Putin until illness or death get in the way. Okay. Um, at the moment, it's hard to see enough figures within the elite turning against him. You know, if we look at the two times there were successful coups in the last hundred years, it was the second time that they tried to oust Khrushchev, mm -hmm. and then it was the 1991 August coup that was then overcome by people power. In both cases, it worked because you had an alliance between government figures, party mm -hmm. figures, the army and the KGB. Mm -hmm. uh, at the moment, I think that the, the FSB, the security apparatus, you know, even if the army is unhappy, the FSB and the National Guard still seem loyal to Putin. And so long as that happens, then he's safe. So it isn't all this, the madness of a single person. Isn't just Putin mad? I mean, look, he's, I mean, he's not <laughs> It's an interesting one, this whole business of, is Putin mad? Because yeah. my, my worry about using terms like mad is that it almost implies we can't possibly predict what he'll do and that mm -hmm. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. yeah. I mean, he is, he is essentially rational, even though he has some lunatic ideas, let's put mm -hmm. it that way. Um, but no, I mean, this is unfortunately the case. You know, there are people around him who either genuinely believe the same things as he believes, I mean, like Nikolai Patrushev, who is secretary of the Security Council mm -hmm. and the closest thing to a national security advisor there is in the Russian system. I think he's even more hawkish than Putin. Um, you know, he's clearly someone who constantly pushes Putin in that direction. Um, so you have people who believe the same sort of nonsense mm -hmm. about, you know, basically that there is a concerted Western campaign to destabilize and maybe even dismember Russia. Mm -hmm. And then you have people who clearly they would almost certainly have no place in a post-Putin order. Mm -hmm. People like um, Viktor Zolotov, the head of the National Guard, um, you know, roundly despised by most of his peers. But the point is, he was an ex-Putin bodyguard who Putin has elevated. You know, he has no future without Putin. So this is it. I think one thing that Putin was very clever about was precisely building a power structure in which 
Yes, there are some figures who clearly have independent political careers, like Sergei Shoigu, the defense minister. Mm -hmm. But there's enough of them who either think the same or just need Putin in place to keep him in power. Mm -hmm. Right. This is my last question. What is the worst scenario for Ukraine? Uh, I mean, I think the worst scenario for Ukraine is that somehow, um, you know, which, which, which could still happen, there is a major reversal on, on the battlefield. The thing is, momentum really matters in warfare. Mm -hmm. And at the moment, Ukrainians have momentum. You know, they're, they're doing much better than anyone expected and so forth. I mean, but they are still being pushed back, mm -hmm. especially on the eastern flank mm -hmm. coming in from, from the Donbass and also the forces that came up from Crimea. Mm -hmm. If we, for example, saw for whatever reason, you know, units breaking and, and, and sort of either fleeing or whatever, it could create a knock-on effect. Mm -hmm. And I think the point is, if the Russians have been able to seize the country quickly, then there would have been a relatively orderly transfer of power to a, no doubt, very unpleasant, mm -hmm. quizzling regime. Now, though, it would be a vengeful, angry, and slightly scared Russia that that, that would be taking over. Um, and therefore, I think you'd see a very different kind of situation. Mm -hmm. um, so I, th I think that that's the sort of the worst case scenario. But in fairness, I must say that so far, at least the Ukrainian forces have demonstrated, you know, very strong morale. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I don't think that's likely to happen. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you very much.